Thank you, Rosanna. So, and thank you for organizing this nice event. Um, and yeah, I have three well-known names and they are fit into this story, I hope, in familiar ways. And I won't speak in such, uh, in, 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 in such detail here. And this, this talk will be a little broader than what uh, Philippe uh, showed us and what uh, Rosanna was talking about with uh, Fano and Zegre and so forth. The, um, I'm going to look at uh, his historiography a bit and, of course, uh, this book of Bonola, the student of uh, Enriquez in Bologna. And uh, so part of this is to kind of contextualize how these stories are told and to kind of look at non-Euclidean geometry from, say, his perspective to begin with. So, um, of course, a, a general point to make here is that it's, it's clear that the history of geometry um, gets a lot of attention around this time. And the story gets very complex because non-Euclidean geometry, as Rosanna indicated, I mean, you have this many layered thing. And so it's obvious that people can stress different aspects of the story and tell the story in different ways. And that just keeps going on. That's not a very, that's not a very novel point. Uh, but Bonola, I think, represents a particular time and tradition. So I've indicated that here by trying to say he is part of a sort of positivistic take on the exact sciences. And the title of his book um, makes you think about a tradition too, an intellectual tradition, um, because this historical critical uh, approach to history is, is partly a didactical uh, approach, a systematic approach. It's not something which is necessarily motivated alone by an, an attempt to understand the past in its own terms. It's a, it's a way of learning a subject through history. And Ernst Mach's uh, famous book that Einstein and people like this read is part of this tradition as well. So I would think Enriquez is a major representative of it as well, and Benola is writing in that tradition, I think. So his book, if you read it, reminds me a lot of other types of works from the same time period that have this type of, of, of take on history. So that's, that's one remark. And Rosanna mentioned it too, the fact that this book appeared in foreign languages right away and elaborated too. So uh, uh, Heinrich Liebmann uh, didn't just translate it, but he actually elaborated on it. And also Karslow elaborated some on the English translation. And these books went through many editions and so forth. And so you have a canonical text and a canonical way of understanding um, the history of non-Euclidean geometry. It's nice because it's very readable. You get into the story very quickly. You get, you get a nice story and so forth. It's rather short. <laughs> it's not a long and extensive thing. And, uh, and it's, of course, to look at the lectures of, of Fano and Zegre enable you to, to look beyond that kind of standard picture that, that has dominated a lot of historiography and go back to a time before the standard picture was available. And, uh, and so there's a, a motivation to, to do that, as with, as with Klein's lectures as well. Um, so I think it's obvious that the, the research in geometry going on in Italy, uh, Zegre and projective geometry, but the Italian tradition in general, and in Germany, and then you talk about uh, the, people like uh, Hilbert, but you could go back to Pasch and talk about other figures too. There's, there's a lot of activity in the foundations of geometry at the same time that the history of the subject is being dealt with. And uh, this affects the way a book like Benola's is also written. Um, so I think the way he tells the story, it's kind of interesting, unlike uh, Fano, I would say the way um, the basic way that Bonola sets it out, Beltrami is not a major figure. I think uh, 
he comes out as a sort of figure whose importance lies within the Riemannian tradition. I mean, Riemann's work is taken to be, so I say here the key figures um, to begin with, Gauss, Riemann, and Klein. Poincaré doesn't show up at all. I, we see this over and over again. We think of Poincaré as such a central figure for hyperbolic geometry, but in, in this early period, his, uh, his works aren't received as, part of, as, a, as central to the tradition. I'll, of course, get to uh, Poincaré, though, in this talk a little later on. And I wanted to compare, actually, with a much later book, just to make the point again that you can do the same sort of thing with any sort of um, interesting book like this. So this, is, this isn't actually a book, it's an essay. It's a, an appendix to the second edition of the geometry book of, of um, Moritz Pasch. And Pasch was an old man at that time and a sort of hero, if you like, and very interesting figure today, in fact, to look at from the point of view of a very modern, formal way of doing geometry. Uh, well, Max Dane, a st leading student of Hilbert, uh, decided to, to publish this in Courant's new, new Yellow ser series, and in order to contextualize the importance of, uh, of Pasha's work, Dane decided to write a historical essay. And of course, then he emphasizes totally different sorts of, sorts of Pasch, obviously, and Hilbert. He barely mentions Gauss at all when he talks about the history of non-Euclidean geometry, which I think is also very interesting for a German to do that, because the Germans had spent so much time playing up the importance of Gauss, who of course never published anything about non-Euclidean geometry, but it was a, a historiographic tradition to, uh, to emphasize how important Gauss was. And of course, Beltrami cites Gauss in, in his work, and that was part of the interesting connection that Beltrami made to a leading authority in mathematics who had thought about non-Euclidean geometry. But uh, Dane, you know, considers Lobachevsky and Bolyai as the pioneering figures and not, and not Gauss. Uh, he emphasizes the importance of Riemann and Helmholtz in that particular tradition. And he doesn't play up Klein either, uh, quite unlike uh, Bonola, who Klein is a huge figure in Bonola's picture. But, of course, he talks about the Cayley metric and so forth, but, you know, and that Klein saw how to use it. But he doesn't emphasize Klein as a, f as a key figure, despite the fact that the major part of that essay is about projective geometry, actually. But it's Pasha's approach to projective geometry and not Klein's approach. And there are some things about Clifford Klein space forms and so forth, but it's a, it's a totally different way of looking at, at this topic. Bonola, of course, makes the major distinction that is very important between a foundation of non-Euclidean geometry, which is, comes from differential geometry, surface theory, Gaussian surface theory, and then Riemann's general approach to differential geometry, so that you get uh, arbitrary spaces of constant curvature. Yeah, yeah, just let me have it back sometime. <laughs> uh, anyone who wants to take a peek at Max Dane, I think it's not a very well-known uh, piece of work, but it's, it's, uh, it's certainly interesting to read. Um, yeah, so that's the one tradition, the differential geometric tradition, Gauss, Riemann, Beltrami, familiar enough. And then there's the projective way of doing things, Cayley and Klein. Cayley has the metric, but of course he doesn't apply it in the general way that, that Klein does, and Klein is a propagandist for this approach to, um, to geometry. Um, yeah, and then of course, uh, at the end of his book, I mean, what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is you now can see through the Cayley-Klein model, if you like, you can see that indeed the parallel postulate is independent of the other postulates of Euclidean geometry. And Bonola pretty much favors that. So you see that that influence is very strong in a, in a very important work, influenced, as we heard, by uh, Enriquez and, and uh, Zegre.
Yeah, so uh, those are some background things, and now I just want to try to make another distinction that's maybe not so commonly made and that Bonola does not make. And I think that, that it's useful to distinguish the tradition that Bertrami is working in from what comes afterward, and it's not usual to couple Klein and Poincaré, but I think in, in simplistic terms it makes sense to say that the impetus for, Bet for Betrami to study non-Euclidean geometry is t totally different than for Klein and Poincaré. And it's just the difference between a physically motivated geometry and one which is just pure mathematics. So th those are my claims for this talk, um, which we can debate afterward to what extent that's really justified. But uh, that's the position I'd like to, to try to take, that the question, what is the true geometry of space, is still, in the time of Beltrami, a very important uh, aspect, and I don't think it's an important aspect for Klein and Poincaré. They treat non-Euclidean geometry as part of pure mathematics, and it's just another way of doing geometry. So, as I say, Bonola does not make this point, uh, at least not very forcefully at all. It's, it's in, I think, a key to the history. So, what does Beltrami write in the beginning, which kind of fits this picture I have? Here's a quote. In recent times, the mathematical public has begun to take an interest in some new concepts which seem destined, if they prevail, to change profoundly the whole complexion of classical geometry. These concepts are not particularly new or recent. The master Gauss grasped them at the beginning of his scientific career, and although his writings do not contain an explicit exposition, his letters confirm that he had always cultivated them and attest his full support for the doctrine of Lobachevsky. So, I mean, this is, this is language that does not ring much like Klein or Poincaré. I mean, it's really, he's recognizing something like a revolutionary uh, attitude about the epistemological role of geometry um, and breaking with the classical tradition in, in which the dominance of Euclidean geometry was always taken for granted. Uh, or that those who thought differently, that was part of a subterranean sort of tradition that hadn't yet arisen. I mean, Bertrami's great importance for one is simply to bring it out in such a way that mathematicians had to confront it. As, uh, as uh, Philippe's talk showed very much, I mean, Uel and all of these people are part of, of a, a theme that's been there for some time, but now in the eight, beginning in 1868, it will become part of a public uh, debate in mathematics and beyond. So this, this is how he couches it, uh, Bertrami. And um, here's the next part that I want to also quote. <clears throat> Much has already been written on the non-Euclidean geometries. Once they scandalized us, now we have become accustomed to their paradoxes. Some people have gone so far as to doubt the truth of the postulate and to ask whether real space is plain as Euclid assumed or whether it may not present a slight curvature. They even suppose that experiment, uh, I'm so sorry, I, this is not Beltrami at all. I have a slide missing here. This is Beltrami, okay. So yeah, I, I remember now. I'm supposed to ask you, who said this? <laughs> this is a question to the audience. It's not Beltrami, it's not Beltrami. Sorry, I forgot what I was doing here. Okay, so who, who said this? That uh, some people have gone so far as to doubt the truth of the postulate and to ask whether real space is plain, as Euclid assumed, or whether it may not present a slight curvature. They even supposed that experiment could give them an answer to this question. Well, needless to say, that this was a total misconception of the nature of geometry, which is not an empirical science. Recognize that? No one wants to stick their neck out, huh? I think it must be on the next slide. Let's see. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's, 
It's Poincaré's review of Hilbert's Grundlagen der Geometrie. It's in that review from 1902. So, you know, he, he of course, he's, his views are well known. I don't need to talk a, a lot about, you know, the, the, the take on that question. And I just, you know, I'm confirming what we actually know about how Poincaré saw this. He, it's, a, it's pure mathematics. And Klein is no different. I'm saying that's what I'm claiming here, that he's no different than, than uh, Poincaré. Okay. Uh, this is the review we wrote and so forth. Uh, and it's a, in general, you could say it's a lengthy and glowing review. I'll come back to it toward the end of the talk. Uh, it's, um, on the other hand, he misreads some of what, what Hilbert is doing. And um, there's a, a sort of divergence between Poincaré and Hilbert when it comes to um, the axiomatization of arithmetic later on. So as time goes on, their views become more and more polarized and they, they're kind of uh, in great opposition. And of course, 1904, that's, uh, things become somewhat more tense with set theory, etc. So that's an interesting side uh, event. This, this kind of back and forth. Um, one of the differences, I think, you could say just very generally in the way Poincaré and, and Hilbert think about things is that uh, Poincaré has more of a feel for ambiguities and more gray zones. And uh, Hilbert's much more of a clear-cut thinker <laughs> who wants to have things very stated very clearly. So I say here he hated ambiguity obscurity was worse, etc. And so in the end, when, when Poincaré is dead and <laughs> Hilbert is polemicizing against his views, I mean, part of what he's saying is the problem with conventionalism is that it's the philosophy of the waffler. It's somebody who can't make up their mind and so forth. It's, <laughs> it's this type of thing. So he becomes uh, a big enemy of, of uh, conventionalism, Hilbert does, at least locally in Göttingen, he's known for that. <clears throat> so this is another quote from that review, but why, among all the axioms of geometry, should this postulate, the parallel postulate, be the only one which could be denied without offense to logic? Whence should it derive this privilege there seems to be no good reason for this, and many other conceptions are possible. However, many contemporary geometers do not appear to think so. In recognizing the claims of the two new geometries, they feel doubtless that they have gone to the extreme limit of possible concessions. So this is again the Poincaré talking about geometry as a pure science, and hey, you know, the axioms are not God-given or whatever, you can do different things and you get different theories and so forth. So he agrees with Hilbert on this very much, that particular point. It's for this reason that they have con conceived these conventional geometers have conceived what they call general geometry, which includes as special cases the three systems of Euclid, Lobachevsky, and Riemann, and does not include any other. And this term general indicates clearly that in their minds, no other geometry is conceivable. They will lose this illusion if they read the work of Professor Hilbert. In it, they will find the barriers behind which they have wished to confine us broken down at every point. So, I mean, you couldn't, Hilbert couldn't ask for a nicer, uh, you know, appreciation of what he was doing. I mean, geometry is not just these things that we have taken for granted. Okay, so the one point that he really doesn't agree with, however, and it's an interesting point, and we've heard about Riemann-Helmholtz and so forth, the space problem, the group concept and so forth. So he criticizes him because there's no trace of an idea that comes from Helmholtz and so forth, and it, of course it begins with a notion of the free mobility of rigid bodies an empirical foundation for, for geometry. And Poincaré thought this was a natural way to do it because after all, geometry has something to do with space. And so this would be a natural way to go at things. 
So I say it's a major misunderstanding. It's a major misunderstanding in that, of course, Hilbert accepts that also. And, and two years later, he writes about geometry on the basis of the group concept. I mean, it, there's not just one foundation. There's a, Hilbert was open to, the, to this very way of doing it too. But he was doing something as close to Euclid as you could get. And one thing people didn't like about Euclid's elements was there's no concept of motion, but to make certain proofs work, uh, Euclid just moves things and so forth. And so Hilbert said, no, we're going to make that an axiom and we're not going to move anything. We're just like, we're not going to have a concept of motion. It's part of rigorizing Euclidean geometry. That's all he was really doing. Okay, so this is, this is what Poincaré attacked, that axiom where, where he states what we would call the side angle side uh, th theorem in Euclidean geometry. It's an axiom and Poincaré doesn't like that. Okay, here are the references in the Saggio to Gauss and Lobachevsky. Um, that comes up and what he very specifically points to is a letter that Gauss wrote to Schumacher, an astronomer, of course. And this thing brings in the formula for the circumference of a general non-Euclidean circle with the parameter k, which is, you can either treat it as the radius of curvature or a curvature constant. Uh, so it's, it's a large value empirically and so forth. And this is what Gauss uh, shows Schumacher that, that actually you can, you can have a constant like this. And Beltrami, of course, picks this up and interprets that constant as the radius of the pseudosphere. So this is from that letter. Here's the, here's the formula, the f familiar formula. And uh, Gauss writes here to Schumacher, we're right at the edge of metaphysics here, actually, because actually to get Euclidean geometry, you have to assume k is infinite. And he says, and that's the empirical part of it, he says, up to now, we cannot measure anything uh, where we can detect the finite value of, of k. So empirically, Euclidean geometry is the best we can do, but theoretically, we might be able to get a value for k or a bound or something like that. <clears throat> now comes the famous question, well, did he ever try to? Did he ever try to get any kind of empirical hold on, on k? So probably uh, a, a number of you know this, but it's kind of interesting from the point of view of historiography, where, where does this story come from? Who pushes the story, how does it become a legend, etc. So it has to do with the geodesic work that Gauss did for several years and he used a huge reference triangle with these three mountain tops in uh, Brocken, Hohenhagen and uh, Inselberg. And you can see the distances are pretty huge. I mean, for the day, you know, this is to measure things uh, with those kinds of distances was, well, he had this heliotrope. He had a very sophisticated measuring techniques and so forth. And when he died in 1855, his, his colleague and friend, Satarius von Waltershausen, said that Gauss actually used this data in order to make uh, a, a, a calculation to, based on the data for the angles in this huge triangle. And uh, that's where this story comes from. He talks in that lecture about anti-Euclidean geometry, something that Gauss was interested in theoretically, and of course that's well known, but this is the only place where we hear Gauss actually try to measure something in order to see if indeed you couldn't measure this k value in effect. Um, so that's what he claims in 1856. Of course, it, it's uh, very early on because hardly anyone knew that Gauss, other than the inner circle of astronomers, knew that Gauss had an interest in non-Euclidean geometry, let alone to, to measure it. Um, and this is just a passing remark, in fact, that was then challenged by Arthur Miller, the historian of physics in 1972. 
And he just called it an unfounded legend uh, in that the evidence for it is, of course, thin. And it might seem a little implausible, too. I mean, it's a big geodesic triangle, but for measurements of the curvature of space, you know, you might want something a little bigger, like stellar parallax or, or something like this. So it's a terrestrial experiment, which you might think on the face of it, why would Gauss ever imagine that would be big enough? Uh, well, anyhow, this, uh, this is an interesting thing, partly because Erhard Schultz actually pursued it, and Sartor Sartorius mentions an angle error of two-tenths of a percent of one second. <laughs> so it's a very, very tiny error that he says, he was making the point that the precision of the measurements is very, very good. And Erhard, anyway, analyzed this. He's written about it more than once, actually, in order to show, well, Miller might be right, but in fact, the numbers match, so that, in fact, you can make the calculations and they come out to exactly what he said. So that's kind of interesting fact. Um, it doesn't really matter for what I'm saying here, but it does show that in the background, obviously Gauss was thinking about the physical nature of space, as Lobachevsky did, and so forth. I mean, this was an issue that was out there, so it's not it's not just the independence of the parallel postulate, there's a physics behind this stuff. And then I think if you read Beltrami, who's citing that letter, and he's citing Lobachevsky, uh, then it's, I cite you here too, because you've worked on the physics of his work in, with uh, spaces of, of constant curvature. So he's doing elasticity theory and, things like that. He's, he's of course, interested in math mathematical physics, and it somehow fits into this new geometry that he's gotten from Riemann. And um, I think it's a, different, it's a different take on things, and I, I believe these things are very important, so I say a little more. First of all, <coughs> Klein's lecture that Rosanna mentioned pushes this story, of course. It's the first thing he tells. So the part of the lecture that isn't published and that we want to publish deals with the history of non-Euclidean geometry and it starts with this, this famous story here. So th this is the text. I'll just summarize what he says here, but he repeats the Sartario story with elaboration actually because he points out, well, we have this triangle but we know that there might be things like atmospheric refraction, the measurements of the instruments can't be perfect. We can't get 180 degrees on the nose, so we take different measurements. And he gives a more elaborate sort of thing to explain that this is evidently what Gauss must have done because Sartarius told us so, that he made this famous measurement. So here's Felix Klein, who is a major figure telling the history of non-Euclidean geometry. He had many, many years to do it because his work was in 1871 and he didn't die until 1925. And so he, uh, he could keep coming back to these things. And the role of Gauss becomes more and more important with time as the Gauss edition gets going, as they discover the Tagebuch and everything else. So it all fits into a Göttingen uh, storytelling context. Yeah, so this is what he says here that, uh, that in fact, um, the, the, the question here is whether or not there's a, uh, with various measurements, you would find some kind of, you'd have to find some kind of a constant deviation from 180 degrees before you could assert that the K was there. And this is, of course, Klein's extrapolation of what must have happened. You didn't find it, and so you assume K is infinite and work with, work with that. This is just kind of, I think, a cute thing to work Poincaré back into the story because there are these th three mountain peaks and so forth, and as Gauss becomes a heroic figure, they build a, a turm on one of these nearest to Göttingen and Hohenhagen, and the ceremony for this thing happens to take place during Poincaré Woche, where Poincaré is invited in 1909 to come 
And Hilbert, of course, is the one inviting him and asking him to come. And so this is the letter that Hilbert wrote to, to Poincaré, asking him, you know, if he can't give one talk on physics and so forth. Minkowski has just died, etc. And then he tells him here, it's hard to read it, but basically he's saying that on the 30th will be Gauss's birthday. And so in the nearby Dransfeld, uh, at the place Hohenhagen, there's going to be an unveiling of the Gauss tomb. And, he, and in parentheses, he says, oh, yeah, this is where he used the, the calculation of uh, the measures in a triangle and so forth. This famous story, which, of course, Poincaré would have to have heard many times, I think. And so he's saying, oh, and we really want you to come and be there, too. So if you think about it, well, Everyone knows Poincaré says this is nonsense. You can't, you can't test, you can't test <laughs> non-Euclidean geometry without additional assumptions. I mean, it looks a little bit like a, a taunt or something. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a nice little anecdote that uh, I don't know if he, if he went or not, uh, if he probably found a way out of it. But, uh, and then there's Karl Schwarzschild, who also did this type of thing. And that's an unknown Göttingen story, so I just allude to it quickly. In the meantime, after Lobachevsky, there are precise parallax figures and so forth, beginning with Bessel. And Schwarzschild uh, is, in 1900, speculating, you know, how, how can I use these to get bounds on an elliptic or a hyperbolic space? And um, so he, he publishes this paper in 1900, sends it to his friend Otto Blumenfeld, uh, Blumenthal in Göttingen. And um, these are the figures that he gets. In the hyperbolic case, 64 light years, the equivalent of at least that big, and it has to be 1600 in a more complex situation with elliptic, an elliptic universe. So he sends this paper to Blumenthal, and Blumenthal, who's a privat docent back then, sort of at first forgets about it and so forth. And then he's very apologetic that <laughs> he never answered and thanked him. And in the meantime, he's showing it to people, including Klein. And so he writes back, and, and people are all excited about this. And Klein doesn't think that this works with elliptic geometry. And so he's arguing against it and so forth. And Blumenthal writes uh, to Schwarzschild about this. So this is kind of an interesting gutting and anecdote about this kind of oral history what goes on in the background. And uh, Klein's objection is that, well, you would see two images of the sun if, if you had an elliptic space. And to get around that, there's a sort of ad hoc explanation that Schwarzschild gives that, well, the light going out in two directions and this huge ge geodesic is going to get absorbed somehow by space. And so you're not going to get that, that second image. So <laughs> this kind of funny, speculations that, you know, cosmologists love or whatever, but it's physical thought and geometry and it's all kind of tied together with astronomical knowledge and speculation. Anyhow, that's another story. I think it's also kind of neat because this is 1900. One year later, what happens? Well, Schwarzschild is called to Göttingen and he's living in the Sternwarte where Gauss used to be, right? They, the quarters that Gauss had in the, in the observatory in Göttingen, that's where, except that it's a little different because Schwarzschild is a bachelor back then and he throws parties and so forth at night and so it has a little bit different atmosphere than uh, in Gauss's day. But otherwise, he's, a, he's the succeeding Gauss. Yeah, so let me jump now way ahead because models are a very typical way to talk about non-Euclidean geometry even though the term model only kind of creeps in once in a while. Usually they're talking about a build or something like that. They don't quite have the word model. So John Milner uh, got interested in hyperbolic geometry after Thurston's work uh, showed that it was very important for classifying three manifolds and so forth and wrote this very nice essay in 1982, and that led John Stilwell to do these English translations of Beltrami's papers from 1868. And uh, 
So this is kind of interesting what these, what these modern mathematicians think is important about this stuff. And of course, they jump right to the models right away. I mean, that's kind of what, after all, that's what's important about, about this early hyperbolic geometry. So Stilwell emphasizes that the so-called Cayley-Klein model is already in Beltrami. And, uh, and it's actually, well, Rosanna has already said a lot of these things. I think Hilbert, of course, showed that this pseudosphere can't be embedded in three space and so forth. You get singularities, but, but uh, anyhow, um, in fact, if you look, you can, if you like, find all three famous models, the Cayley-Klein model, the two Poincaré models, and so forth. If you look at the second paper, and read it properly, I guess, uh, then, then you see these sorts of things. So anyway, Milner makes these remarks and then Stilwell does these translations in order to correct the historical record. In other words, he's, he sees an injustice has been done and we should no longer talk about Cayley Klein, it's Cayley Beltrami. And then they find some predecessors, Riemann, Beltrami, so Poincaré is no longer there again. He's sort of been pushed out and Beltrami gets a lot of the credit. So this is a different way to do history, I guess, but uh, uh, the, the thing is that models and modern axiomatics really don't happen back then. I mean, what we're talking about at the time of Beltrami or Klein or even Poincaré is really that it's not just the word model, but you need something like modern axiomatics before you can kind of understand the importance of a model. I think a, you know, a model is something that is used in order to prove something about an abstract system of geometry. So we all know this, I think, but this is sometimes forgotten. It's a difference between classical mathematics rooted in the 19th century, when you're talking about geometry anyway, and 20th century abstract geometrical theory which has to be legitimized if you don't have some kind of sense somehow. As a mathematician, I mean, that could be an intuitive sense, I suppose, but, but in the end, you want to have some clear evidence that what you're talking about exists or is consistent. And so you get this problem that Hilbert famously raised, you know, about proving the consistency of axiom systems. And that's, of course, the modern context for thinking about models. So I think it's, it's kind of a, it, 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 it distorts things if you just import all that back into the 19th century. That's my only point there, really. And that Hilbert uses models, of course, in a whole different setting. Okay. Um, so really, the tricky thing is always to try to figure out what are the motivations of leading figures when they're doing some work like non-Euclidean geometry. What, what was motivating Beltrami or Klein or Poincaré? What, if it's not that they're looking for some new model to prove consistency or whatever. Um, and here I think, again, you could say Beltrami's work shows he's an important transitional figure, particularly because he reacts very quickly to Riemann's ideas once he learns them. So in the Saggio, he doesn't know them. And in fact, he's saying that he can get something like a representation or a, a real substrate, right, for the plane, uh, Lobachevskian geometry. So that's okay to do two dimensions, but he says, he doesn't see any way to do that for three dimensions. Then he reads Riemann and writes his second paper and, and somehow he's, uh, he's broken through to, to something um, more familiar. So along the way, this, what I say here, this, this hegemonic status of the geometry of physical space is, is going to recede away in a complicated way. And I think Beltrami is, is really the key uh, transitional figure leading that way so that people afterward will not be so concerned about it. So what about Klein? Well, 
I think it's interesting then, I don't, I don't personally think it makes much sense just because the group concept is associated with Klein to think of, um, of the Riemann-Helmholtz space problem as, as, as really something connected with him. Sophus Lee, obviously, is the figure to name there, but not Klein. And he only, in his Erlangen program, only makes very brief mention, actually, of non-Euclidean geometry. So that, I think, is significant. He distances himself from earlier work and makes it very clear he's talking about a so-called non-Euclidean geometry. It's so-called, uh, it's just a new way of doing projective geometry where you get a metric, as Cayley did, by attaching a, a, an absolute figure. So he has a new understanding of geometry in the 1870s. I, I contend it has nothing to do with the geometry of space. It's just like in the case of, of Poincaré. He doesn't say it as flatly as Poincaré, but I think it's, it's very clear. Um, this way of looking at things is a way to understand what we geometers are doing. I mean, that's the, that's the full title of the Erlanger program, this kind of dull title. Comparative observations on recent geometrical investigations. He wants to give a sense of what the enterprise is about, the group concept and invariance is the key to that, of course. But his main aim is to identify the larger conceptual framework that underlie the trends in contemporary geometrical research. That was the goal of this paper. To give a simplified picture, do not blur it with metaphysical questions. How am I doing for time, Rosanna? Um, ten, ten minutes, okay. So he, uh, no phil philosophical or metaphysical things enter into this. It's just a way of looking at this very mathematically. And he basically, he could have used non-Euclidean geometry actually as one of the main examples, but he doesn't. He uses other examples that don't rely on that. So, um, so I think his agenda is really a different one. And, um, and so I call him an ag agnostic on this question of whether or not space is Euclidean or non-Euclidean. It's a separate set of issues and so forth. Um, okay. So I think another thing is the fact that he lives for so long and he gets to keep promoting his ideas uh, makes him someone who influences the historiography, of course, and also through the Italian connections and so forth. You don't see this with the other two. Bertrami, other than Fano, admires his work a lot, I guess, but, but he's not somebody who he himself and Poincaré also aren't promoting this story but Klein is telling stories along the way. So in his early work from 1871, he actually says that Bertrami gave the first representation of plain hyperbolic geometry. Then he got the following quote, kind of got him into a little bit of difficulty, I think. He wrote, it's only a short step from the formulae of Bertrami to those of Cayley. But he's talking there about the formalism of it. I mean, the background to how you ground it is totally different. And so in a sequel that he publishes a year later, he actually goes into, you know, what's wrong with Bertrami's way of doing it. Because his claim, of course, is going to be that um, you need to do it from a more general way without a metric. You put the metric in, and then you get different types of possible geometries. And also this business about spaces of constant positive curvature, well, Bertrami seems not to have had the idea of an elliptic uh, structure. He was looking at a spherical geometry, which of course, then the first postulate of geometry no, no longer works. You don't have a unique geodesic that passes through two given points, because you can have, you can have um, polar points. So Klein's general point of view, the one that Bonola pushes and that becomes, at a certain time period, quite, quite favored when projective geometry is very popular and well known, 
is you, you start with those concepts and you do not take a differential point of view. He, he rejected then that as the basis for the foundations of geometry. And, uh, and then you have the freedom to choose a absolute figure and you get different types of metrics and you know what you can do in, with them. It's a, it's a tool for doing mathematics. And he, he gave students different types of, of things you can work out. One of the advantages the, of the hyperbolic or an elliptic metric is that the angle and length measurements enter dually, which of course is not the case in a Euclidean metric. So you get, you get to play with that kind of duality and so forth. And this turns out to be fairly nice for certain types of theories. Um, you, you lose, of course, the, the uh, similarity theory of, Euclid of Euclidean geometry. You have an absolute uh, unit in both of the non-Euclidean geometries. So um, this business of getting at motivations, I mean, it's, it is very tricky especially in Poincaré's case, but in the case of Beltrami and Klein, they at least cite their sources. At some point you get to know what's going on. And in the case of Poincaré, he rarely cites sources anyway. He's too busy thinking about the next thing he wants to do. And, um, and so even Klein, I think, doesn't quite understand what Poincaré uh, was doing when they entered into this famous competition for, in automorphic functions. And just to back that up a little bit, of course, the big ideas are very clear to us now. In eight, the work in 1880 that was unpublished has now been published, and we see what he was doing. But back then, Ermit knew, and Ermit um, wrote to him that in 1880 that this technique of working on uh, number theoretic forms and so forth using non-Euclidean geometry made no sense to him. He couldn't figure out what he was doing. My conjecture there is that that may have been a reason why Poincaré in 1881-82, when he actually starts publishing his work, only mentions non-Euclidean geometry, but he doesn't use it. So you never really see how it enters into the theory in any very clear way. But when Klein and Poincaré start corresponding in June of 1881, the very first thing Poincaré tells him is, oh, well, I can well imagine that you probably have some of these results already that I've been publishing because uh, I know that you're aware of non-Euclidean geometry, that you understand it, and that's the clue to this, this subject. So he, he tells him flat out that that's what's going on. But we know through, later on through his conventionalism what kind of position he'll take about it. It's not agnostic like Klein. It's actually stronger. It's much stronger than what Klein said. You, Poincaré will insist you have to lay down physical as well as mathematical criteria if you're ever going to test the geometry of space. You can't just have some pure mathematical, purely geometrical way of ever doing that. That was the quote we saw before. And of course, later on, that becomes famous. And so people who are famous like Einstein, they have to struggle with what Poincaré had to say about the foundations of geometry. This is 1920, though. It's le much later, relativity, et cetera. It's not my topic, but uh, it's, it doesn't go away, these, these issues about the, the role of geometry and experience in this talk of Einstein. Now, if I just have a couple of minutes, I guess I'll just say a few more things about Hilbert and Poincaré. And here I have just, you know, so you, can, you can kind of see the encounters, collisions, and performances because um, they, they intersect in all kinds of interesting ways. I mean, these are the two huge figures of their time, and they are totally different types of mathematicians who react in different ways to each other. Um, but uh, just to stay with non-Euclidean geometry, I mean, this was this point that he criticized before. Poincaré uh, really insists that you have to link uh, geometry somehow to the notion, the, the fundamental notion of motion or group. And the group is the central thing. So in this case, which groups uh, 
come into play when you're talking about what Riemann and Helmholtz had figured out and that is that, um, that to have free mobility of rigid bodies you need a manifold or a space of constant curvature. So this is, uh, this is actually what, um, what in that review that I gave earlier, this is, this is the topic he really goes after. So just a few things out of it, you see, you see he's starting here with uh, some historical remark or whatever, after a first period of naive confidence in which we cherish the hope of demonstrating everything, then came Lobachevsky, the inventor of non-Euclidean geometries. But the true meaning of this discovery was not fathomed all at once. So you see here, now he does enter into the picture of what is the significance of non-Euclidean geometry. And here, of course, it is tied into the issue of space. So Helmholtz, of course, was starting with an empirical basis. And so this, for Poincaré, is the right way to think about this, this topic. If it's going to be tied to, tied to something physical at all, then why not start with something like this? So, Helmholtz showed in the first place that the propositions of Euclidean geometry were no, no other than the laws of motion of rigid bodies, while the propositions of the other geometries were the laws which might govern other bodies analogous to the rigid bodies. Bodies which doubtless do not exist, but whose existence might be conceived without leading to the least contradiction. Bodies which we might fabricate if we wished. So you see it's kind of running off into, yeah, things we can discover possibly in, in nature. So anyway, you can kind of see from these remarks the, the, the take that uh, in 1902 that, uh, that Poincaré had on, on the proper foundations of geometry. And of course, Lee was the one who picked this up so that he, don't have time to talk about Sophus Lee, but he enters in a very interesting and dramatic way into into the story and connects with French mathematics in a big way. Uh, he gets to meet Poincaré then in 1882 and he feels very much like the French of that generation are the ones who understand him and so forth. And he had already then the idea of working on the space problem which becomes kind of, the, that's the pinnacle of the third volume of his uh, transformation groups of 1893. Yeah, so anyway, he, you can see Poincaré is talking about Lee's work here. Lee had died in 1899, so this is about three years later. But I shall stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
in Germany, for example, or in Italy, was this metaphysical tradition taught to students? So no. So, in, so in, in, in the time of Beltrami, or at the time we're talking about. And Beltrami mm -hmm. approaching these questions, in, in, in my opinion, in rather similar way at exactly the same time, although Helmholtz at that point had read Riemann, which was not the case for Beltrami. But the, the replique that Helmholtz is making, the reply of Helmholtz to Riemann, is not so different. I mean, it's different in detail, of course, from the overall way of, of, of looking at the question. So, so I, I'm wondering if there is some kind of uh, way in which students acquire that way of thinking, let us say, in their science classes, whereas is there a countervailing tradition in the context of their philosophy classes? It's actually a very difficult question, but it's one I've, I've, I've wondered about for a long time, and I just wonder if you know anything that sheds light on this issue. I mean, did everybody know Kant's, did everybody that finished gymnasium know Kant's ideas about Job. Well, I think I think presumably, you know, when not everybody knew, but uh, but presumably in certain circles, these ideas, in some general sense, were were very well known. And even if you didn't know what was behind them in the whole critique sort of layout, you know, the the the, the very natural and strong tradition of Newtonian mechanics or something like this speaks to a space in which you have a parallel structure built in. I mean, this is the natural way to think about physics for a long time, and the mechanical worldview carries on a long, long time in the 19th century. So there are probably a whole lot of underlying things. Kant would be part of it, and, and, and so on, that would, would, it's just general conservatism, I would think, you know, would say, like, why in the world do we need these, n these new fangled sorts of things? And so these few people we, concentrate on who were doing the very new things and struggling, struggling, you know, very, very strong. There's huge resistance all over the place. So part of what I was trying to kind of indicate was an awareness of such general sorts of things. And then their strategies, I would say, that, that Klein and Poincaré, it's part of this is a strategy. You know, you, you accept a sort of theory, but you're not going to push the physicality of it and so forth. And, and I'm thinking that in this, this is the, the other people who know more about Beltrami here in the audience, but I'm thinking uh, that Beltrami is probably, yeah, it's not, it's not yet time to, to, to jump in and, and, and free oneself. This business, too, about Riemann I, I, troubles me a great deal because, you know, how many people really understood Riemann in 1868 when that, first came av available. So they, they pick up certain things. And there's that nice article, of course, in Historia that Olivier just wrote about the, you know, but you see, I mean, the, these ideas and so forth are, are so out there that I just think there's certain elements of Riemann that help to free Beltrami to Except that Lobachevsky's space in three dimensions could, well, you can do that. No. I, I mean this. Yeah, I can't. I can't answer. I can't answer your question. But the thing about, I don't think we should talk about it in terms of whose students and so forth. I mean, basically, this is all very cutting edge stuff that doesn't. Yeah, Riemann, of course, was just talking to himself, you know, in these lectures and whatnot. These are not, these are not uh, typical, I think, at all of, of the type of teaching that, you know, in the very, very small circles of people, too, uh, who took, who took these, these sorts of courses. And it's a, it's a different set of questions, I almost think, you know, that, uh, so the, the, the general knowledge, that's what you're really getting at, I think, you know, what, what's the general knowledge that, one has to take into account uh, when talking about these people, and and then how does uh, how does what these cutting edge 
how do these cutting edge ideas fit into that, that f setting? And that's, that's difficult, I can't, uh, I can't, uh, well, Philippe, what? J'avais oublié que c'est défini, alors je vais, je vais parler en français. <rire> euh, sur cette citation euh, de, de Poincaré, c'est le début, it's the beginning of the of a philosophical program developed by Henri Poincaré. Uh, in this program, he, he tried to derive the space, the geometrical space, from the geometry on the boot. Yes. 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 And this, this, is, this is also very close to Lee, right? To, to, to Lee as well. That, 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 I mean, they're thinking along the same lines, yes. Yeah, and I think he, at this point, he thinks this is, I mean, he emphasizes this is the, the most vital way to think about the, the foundations of geometry, because it comes from some natural, in the quote, see, I don't know if you can, if you can explain, that in the quote, he, he seems to suggest that this, this approach could, could give us something new, something new to, to think about. I mean, Um, do you have an example out of Germany um, about the, um, uh, the link between astronomy and non Euclidean geometry? I, I Newcomb, for example, I mean the American. Uh yeah, Newcomb, Newcomb was one of the first to yeah, think about elliptic geometry. Yeah. Uh, some other attempts to. Um, uh, try to, for example, generalize uh, uh, the gravitational law in the spaces, uh, non Euclidean spaces in the universe. Yeah, I suppose an, a, a, another figure who thinks quite physically and, and was quite influential in some ways is Clifford. Clifford read, Clifford read Riemann and so forth, and, and, and the Clifford Klein space forms and so forth is another geometric setting to get, to get things which are, of course, um, yeah, already geometrically very, very uh, unintuitive, but somehow, but somehow fundamental. I mean, like that Poincaré quote in the, in the beginning, you know, uh, the, Clifford, the Clifford parallelism and, and so forth is really just a replacing looking at a different set of, of axioms and then and then you do something which you can do in in Euclidean space you take three skew lines and you ask what what do you get with all the all the lines that meet those three lines and you get a quadra you get a you get a, a quadric surface you get a, a hyperboloid of one sheet but that object in elliptic space you know is is a torus that's flat you know that's that's, uh, that's the Clifford, that was the example that Clifford taught to Klein in 1873 and that eventually led to the, so you have people like that, but it's not astronomy, so I, I don't know who in astronomy really, I mean, the Schwarzschild is, is, is a rather brilliant person, so he, he did a lot of <laughs> things like that, and I think it was just a game for him too. I don't think he was really taking that, that seriously, these parallax, calculations, it was just, let's, let's see what we get, you know, or something, but it, it's not something that had any consequences for his research or anything. He just did it once and, you know. <laughs> did Klein order a... Uh, one of, oh, you mean the, the ones that she showed, or? Oh, I, those, they're not, they're, I think they're not plaster, are they? What are they made of, the, the bitrami? Is it like paper mache or something like that, yeah. But these are one of a, one of a I don't think these were ever, um, did they distribute those at all, or were they, were they just made for, bitrami made these and, 
Yeah. And they, they didn't make more copies, or did they? Mm -hmm. Of course, they made they made uh, later on these 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 plaster things, which uh, th but that that was then original at the time that Klein was with uh, Alexander von uh, Brill in 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 Munich. So they were of course making the pseudosphere models and and things like that, and the geodesics on them, and there's a, a whole bunch of of interest, of course, in in these famous uh, famous objects at that time. Yeah, but I, he didn't have to order, or, well, he, he could have, I guess, but he, I don't, I'm not sure, did Klein correspond with uh, Beltrami, do you know? Is there any correspondence between them? Yeah, between Beltrami and Klein? Just a little, yeah. Yeah, but, yeah. But in your book of the Uel and Uel and Beltrami, uh, I mean Beltrami more or less had this Cayley metric idea already, and uh, before Klein published it, in yes, he says so. He says that uh, he had the he had the idea of uh, um, this um, absolute. Yes, the attaching an absolute figure. Yes. Yes, before Klein, but yes. Uh, he didn't publish. And he realized uh, afterward that uh, it was a good idea. In fact, he had just the intuition, but he uh, didn't follow this idea. After Klein's uh, proof, uh, he regret. The very first papers of Klein, I mean, he, he learned a lot of things from, from word of mouth, from Otto Stolz and people like that. But when he first publishes, you see he's read all the stuff, so he, he cites pretty much everybody in his, in his writing, so that's the opposite of, of Poincaré, of course, who doesn't hint too much about where his ideas come from. Yeah, Martina. Yeah. Um, well, I can speculate. I don't have any correspondence or anything, but I, but I think it's pretty clear that, you see, Pasch and Klein disagreed about the foundations of projective geometry, and, even, and Pasch even writes that in the, in the preface, that in the original edition. Uh, so anyway, uh, the, the difference is simple. Uh, Pasch had a sort of empirical approach as well. He thinks that geometry comes from an empirical study, and uh, unlike Klein, he thinks that the right way to do it is to actually start with a metric. So you have, you have something which is a, a metric, a congruence concept or something, and, and use that for the foundations of geometry. And, uh, and Klein, of course, wanted to derive that from a, a, a projective invariant, you know, by attaching, as Cayley did, attach a figure if you attach a, a second degree curve in a plane and then you have two points on a line, then you get two more points and now you've got four points in a line and you've got the cross ratio. So you can, you can get the metric as soon as you attach that figure. Uh, but Pasch didn't think this was appropriate for his sort of philosophy of, of geometry, which, which Dane I think very much agrees with and the whole point for Dane I think is the rigorization of, of elementary geometry because Pasch is very, very careful to, to step by step argue through things and there is no intuition or anything like that, these things that Klein very much liked, of course. Um, so you, you're pushing everything back to fundamentals and the foundations are different and so forth. So yeah, it's, it's a different style of, of presenting a modernized uh, elementary projective geometry. And I think I think Dane 
yeah, more or less agreed with that type of style. Okay. Mm -hmm.